Welcome to Fortify Live. We're back with another episode, and this week we're in for a treat. How do you stop victimhood? And our, we have a special guest today, a friend of mine and a mentor that I, I've been a mentor or a mentee of his for almost 30 years now. And so I want to welcome uh, Randy Gage to our presentation today. Randy, um, I mean, I'm so glad you even found time in your, in your schedule to join us for this episode. But I, when I was thinking about mindset, and success mindset, I couldn't have thought of anybody better than you for this topic. And so thank you for joining the show today. I just love that you're doing that. I think I wish more people who promoted or, you know, the marketing gurus and the business consultants and the business coaches, I wish they would spend more time on the mindset stuff, on the prosperity consciousness stuff, because People don't understand you can have all the, you can have a million strategies, methods, and techniques for how to do this stuff. But if you've got this subconscious programming that you're not worthy or you don't deserve success or any of these other things that create self-sabotage, they don't get the breakthrough. So I love the fact that you're, you know, I think it's a, an example of why you're, work is so good for people. I know you do a lot in the franchise space. You do a lot with entrepreneurs and they really need this aspect. Well, one of the topics that, that I got from you, I mean, it, at the first event that we did in 94 together, you know, you said to me, you said, you know, all the strategies, tactics in the world won't help you if you don't have your mindset. So you can go to all the seminars, you can read all the books, you can take all the classes, you can go through all the master classes, but without your mindset dialed in, there's nothing you can do. And, and that's been a foundation of my keynote presentations now. So now when I'm talking, I say, you know, it's not what you know, it's how well you execute and it has to do with your mindset. So why would anybody really self-sabotage themselves? I mean, why would they do that? They do that because they have no idea they're doing it. It's most of the time it's, the result of subconscious beliefs they have that they have no awareness of whatsoever. So they, they might've been programmed, you know, and the, 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 the usual, the, the usual suspects who program this organized religion, governments, uh, and marketers, social media, media platforms. There's so much of these mind viruses floating around. Money is bad. Rich people are evil. You're not worthy. You don't get your reward until the afterlife. If you're trying to be successful, you must be a terrible mommy or a terrible daddy. If you know, look at the billionaires shouldn't exist. Mind virus that's going around the world right now. I mean, think about that. Billionaires shouldn't exist. So, and I have dear friends who, who support that, right? They, I have a friend who plays softball by center fielder, has a t-shirt. Billionaires shouldn't exist. Wow. I'm like, so what happens? Do we, when somebody reaches a net worth of a billion dollars, do we kill them? And he's like, no, we don't kill them. We just stop their income right there. So, okay, so everything, so what's, but you don't, a billion doesn't work for you because you said billionaires shouldn't exist. So is it? Uh, 999 million? Is it 900 and 900 million? Is it 800 million? You know, what's the limit? And he's like, ah, ah, ah. and then I'm like, and who decides the limit? You decide the limit because you only make $40,000 a year. So you're going to be the arbiter of that. Have you really thought this out? <laughs> right? But so imagine that guy, my friend who wears that t shirt. Right. He gets a new job or a new career and he's, you know, really moving up the success chain and he's getting promoted or he's an entrepreneur and his business is blowing up. What's he going to do? He's going to self-sabotage himself because he's thinking he doesn't even know he's thinking it. But in, in his mind, he's saying, oh, my God, if I don't stop this right now, I'm going to be one of those terrible people that I hate. And then my family won't love me anymore. My friends won't respect me anymore. 
people are going to wear t-shirts that say I shouldn't exist. <laughs> so I better just sabotage myself right now. And then I don't have to worry about all that stuff. And none of that happens on a conscious level. It's totally on a subconscious level. And so, you know, how does it show up? Like, I know it's on a subconscious level, but what are some examples of self-sabotage? And then we're going to talk about how you actually stop it. But what are some examples of sabotage? But before you do that, as you answer, for me, self-sabotage is um, delusional thinking. You know, it's like, it's like you think you're being productive, but you're just busy, right? So I always ask, you know, are you really using the highest and best use of your time? Or are you just, are you just full of shit? Whoops, pardon me. I didn't hit the button. So, so this is our show. We can say what we want on this show. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it shows up. And I think that no matter what level of success that you get to, there's always more. I mean, you want to be satisfied with where you're at, but there's always things that, that pop in and you self-sabotage yourself. But so what, what are some ways that our listeners, and we've got entrepreneurs and executives all across the globe, what are some things and, and pathways to help them stop the self-sabotaging behavior? Well, we say success leaves clues. I would say self-sabotage leaves a, a paper trail, a pattern, a, a systemic evidence. Uh, I remember getting my business seized by the IRS and they auctioned it off. And you know the story very, very well. Uh, they auctioned it off for my unpaid tax debts. And so I was broke, sleeping on the floor, selling my furniture. My health was a mess. My relationships were a mess. Everything in my life was miserable. Everything in my life was broken. That's the self, that's the pattern. That's the uh, systemic evidence, right? Because you'll see, you'll, you'll sabotage yourself in all kinds of different areas. You'll blow up your marriage. You'll destroy your friendships. You'll get fired from jobs that you should be excelling at. You'll be getting swindled because you'll be making stupid decisions and buying Doge coins and shit coins and, uh, you know, putting your money with FTX or any one of these other exchanges that, uh, you know, abscond with the money. Because this is the evidence that at a core foundational belief level, you don't believe you deserve success. So it might be, you know, like in my case, it was health challenges. It was relation, you know, I'm like, okay, I've had 11 negative dysfunctional relationships in a row. So, you know, you can go, oh, my bitch ex-wife and oh, my ex-girlfriend did that. Okay, but when you got 11 in a row, like I did, you have to say, okay, was there one person who was always at the scene of the crime? And, and that's where I think you, that's where, you know, when you have, oh, do we have a, a money bell, a, a drop the mic bell? Is that what that is? <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Yeah, you know, it's like, that's what you see is the, it'll turn into a lifelong pattern if you don't recognize it and blow it up. So the first step, of course, is they recognize it, but where should they start? So if, if, you're, if they're watching this and they, and they want to evaluate whether or not they are, should they take a look at where they are right now and what, what their dreams are? Because I think a lot of people have those dreams. They, they have those aspirations and then it gets beat out of them and they, they find up in the grind and then they become, they fall victim to victimhood. And you know, it's like now the, the going around this quiet quitting, right? And in business, quiet quitting is just another word, way of saying disengaged, right? So it's really, it's not that it, they just gave it a fancy term, but there's been disengagement in the workforce for years. And, you know, when I have someone who's disengaged, certainly I want to coach them and, and move them to standards. But did I hire right in the first place? Did I create a culture that allows them to be successful? And then if they're, if they're not coachable, if they don't have that mindset piece, if they don't have that integrity and prosperity and abundance mindset, it's time to free them up for new opportunities to go, to go be someone, you know, to, to have opportunities to go work somewhere else. Right. Whoops. I don't know what that button was. All right. So, 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 so yeah, go ahead. 
over my shoulder for you guys who are watching, or I guess it's the other shoulder, I got the reverse here, for you guys watching on the video, uh, is the cover of my latest book, uh, Radical Rebirth. The approach I took there was, I, th I divided your life into six major belief categories. And that's where prosperity is created. That's where victimhood is escaped. So you look at, you know, you know just off the top of my head, I'd say, you know, the, the six main areas, of, uh, you know, the key ones were uh, health and wellness, marriage and relationships, God and religion, uh, money and success, right? Uh, jobs or career. And it's like, what's your core foundational beliefs on that? So if you think that money is evil, and money is bad and rich people are evil and those things we talked about a couple minutes ago, um, you have a really negative dysfunctional belief about money. If your parents cheated on each other or one was abusive to the other, they were bickering in the house all the time, you have a core dysfunctional belief about marriage and relationships. And you're probably gonna repeat it. You know, why are so many children of alcoholics, alcoholics? Why are so many children of drug addicts, drug addicts? Why are so many uh, children of abusers become abusers? they buy into the thought pattern, right? They, they get the subconscious programming. They're not even aware of it. So, um, you know, the, in, in the book, I, I did a separate chapter on each of the six areas and kind of broke out like, okay, here's the, here's the, the negative beliefs that show you you've got issues in that area, right? And then, and then when you point, when, when I can point them out to people, that's when they really recognize them. And as you alluded to, you know, when you set up the question, which is, hey, awareness is the first big breakthrough of the, of the problem. Once you become aware of the problem. Okay, so I think money is evil. Does that belief serve me? Well, no. Man, it sure doesn't. Okay, what's an, an empowering belief I could have about money? Wow, money would allow me to do amazing things. I could start a charity. I could support an orphanage in Africa. I could build drinking water wells in Africa. I could buy malaria uh, mosquito nets. I could uh, save the whales. I could save the tofu burgers. I can save the rainforest, you know. Uh, and you start to think, wow, okay, so I've replaced a negative belief about money with an empowering belief about money. I've replaced a negative belief about myself, my skills, my success, my ability to reach success, and I replaced it with an empowering belief. Uh, so now when you change the beliefs like that, you change everything. Your whole life gets better because uh, you know, as you know, well, you've done a lot of work in self-development for it. And, yeah. and you know, the subconscious mind is so much more powerful than the conscious mind. And when you program your subconscious mind, it doesn't argue, it doesn't rationalize, it doesn't analyze, it just does what it's been programmed to do. And so when you get the right programming in there, everything changes. That makes so much sense. So what I've done, uh, as I, whoops, I'm going to push this one. So I have my radical reboot birth here and it's post notes. And I know that people were going to ask for it. So I went ahead and I posted uh, a comment on all the platforms uh, to the Amazon link. So they can, you know, get radical rebirth, um, kill off the old you and create a new life. So I highly recommend you check that out um, for those listeners that want to have something in your success library that it's going to help you create the foundation to stop the success. Now, I know you've got this podcast that's real popular too. Tell me more about, I mean, I know you, well, first of all, you got off of social media, right? You've taken sabbaticals, you know, even promoting this, you're like, I'm not on Facebook, I'm not on Twitter, I'm not here, I'm, I'm only spending time in these areas. And that was to protect your mindset. And then also, so I wanna look at, you created the podcast, but then also 
why you chose to not be on TikTok and not be on some of the other social media platforms. Was it to yeah, protect your mindset? Just, was it to protect the mindset? Absolutely, it was to protect my mindset, right? So if what I think the real, the, the, the biggest dangers of social media are numerous, but a few that I think we should look at and really important for entrepreneurs, like the people who listen and watch this, is it's an outrage machine, right? The media, back in the day, the media was a nonprofit thing, right? If you were ABC, NBC, or CBS, or the equivalent in other countries, then the government gave you a license to be a broadcaster and you could sell soap and cars and products all day long and make money from commercials. And it was a very lucrative business. And in exchange for that license, for that right to broadcast, you were required to do a certain amount of public service uh, program. So they took that as the news. Every night we're gonna do the uh, nightly news at 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. And they hired objective journalists as best they could, Edgar R. Murrow and Walter Cronkite and Huntley and Brinkley and whoever, um, to present the news. Then Ted Turner comes along, he starts Cable News Network, at first Headline News and Cable News Network, and then um, Fox News started and MSNBC started, and all of a sudden these were 24-hour cable channels that needed viewers, and they weren't uh, doing any public service thing. They were money machines. These were multi-billion dollar machines that generated that, that cash, and they need fear and outrage to survive. How do they get it? They post on social media, right? What is the, you know, what is the economic engine of Twitter and Parler and Gitter? And it's fear and outrage. So that's the first thing. So now the, the whole main media network is designed to scare you and polarize you. And then you get on social media, and so you demonize the other side, you, you dehumanize them, you become polarized, and, you know, or you're just doing, the other thing, the danger of it is, it's just the narcissism. Right. The narcissism of, oh, here I am at this resort in Hollywood, and I'm, you know, in Hawaii, and I'm frolicking on the beach, and my kids are beautiful, and I'm so happy, and my marriage is so perfect, which is all bullshit, right? This is the last trip that you and your wife did, and say, we're going to try it one more time before we get a divorce, and, you know, the counselor recommended this, and you're not writing that shit on Instagram. Right, right. Like, oh, we're here with the kids having the time of our life. And so everybody is judging everyone else by their public posts. And then they're comparing themselves to their real life and beating themselves up and thinking, well, my life isn't so perfect. Like, man, Ford is in Tahiti drinking out of a coconut and I'm here scraping the ice off my windshield in Kenosha, Wisconsin at 6 a.m. and there's 20 below zero wind chill factor, right? So, and wow, I, I, I'm at this restaurant and I love this ribeye steak, so I'm gonna put a post on right. Facebook. It's just narcissism. And so if you're, if, you know, and if I wasn't an author, I would have never joined any social media site. I joined social media because I realized, okay, this is how I can promote my work. And I did an amazing job of that, right? I am a power user. I have lots of followers on lots of platforms. And I just realized, okay, I don't want to play that game anymore. I'm going to, you know, I've got 14 books out. I've got a body of work. At some point, I have to be confident enough in my work to know that I don't have to go out and flog it three hours a day on social media. Uh, so I closed them all down and left them all. And uh, a few months ago, I said, I'm gonna go back on Twitter because I love Twitter for the, the insights and the wisdom it can bring me, you know? Um, because I follow amazing, brilliant people, right? So if somebody tells me, yeah, but everything I see in the Twitter feed is such crap. Well, 
but where are you following? Right. Right now, I, there is some because I follow uh, smart people who sometimes get trolled by the trolls and then they start responding to the trolls. And so some of that leaks into my timeline. So I still moderate the amount of time I spend on it. Um, but for the most part, I've chosen people of higher consciousness and brilliant people that challenge my thinking and cause me to grow. So for like anybody watching or listening, hey, you want to interact with me? Great. Follow me on Twitter and hit me up. Give me a shout. We'll talk. Facebook, Instagram, all that other stuff. I'm just, I, you know, my team will post the links when I make a podcast or they post the links when I have a new blog up or something, but I don't interact with people there. And I absolutely would never put TikTok on one of my devices because that is just the CCP spying on you to yeah. be able to manipulate you and the American political system or British or wherever you live better. I mean, that's just a corrupt, um, you know, Trojan horse. So, so it brings me to critical thinking, right? Because that's, you know, you've taken a lot of heat over the years when people don't really understand you in the speaking industry and in, in the other industries that we've been in where people will, they don't know you, but they'll say, oh, well, he's, He's a, a, um, a fundamentalist or he's, he's someone who's extreme. And, and it, whenever I hear that, you know, because you and I have been working together for over 30 years, I always think they don't, they don't really know. They've never really read any books. They've never really done anything. And so talk to me about the concept of critical thinking. How can you help someone transform from being part of the herd and actually using critical thought to make decisions? Okay, I love this question. And for you guys who are intrigued by this question, go to randygage.com, sign up for my newsletter called Gage on Prosperity. And I do a issue every Friday called Friday Philosophy, where I challenge you. I put some ideas, some concepts, some topic for you to reflect on, introspection, and think about. And I have already written where today is Wednesday, but I finished writing the post for Friday. And the Lornette will do one final proofread and spell check, and then it'll go up on, you know, 2 a.m. on Friday, uh, uh, Friday morning. And it's exactly on that topic of how we get manipulated, how we get programmed, how we get uh, how we fall into negative thinking patterns. And these negative patterns often cause self-sabotage and they often just prevent you from being successful, from being healthy, from being happy. Um, so a big part of that is, you know, you've got to question the premise. Like what happens, one of the things I wrote about is, you know, how people become fanboys of someone or something and then they lose all their critical thinking skills. Because once you identify as something, then you, you basically, it's a volunteer lobotomy because you don't want to then accept any thoughts that challenge who you identify as. So if you say, I'm a progressive liberal, you will adore everything AOC and Elizabeth Warren says. And anything that Mitch McConnell says, or Donald Trump says, or Nikki Haley says, you're gonna discount it immediately because it threatens your identity. If you identify as a MAGA follower, you're gonna immediately discount anything that AOC or Elizabeth Warren says, right? Because it threatens your identity. We don't like, once we create an identity, and it could be a, a very positive identity. You could consider yourself an environmentalist. You could consider yourself a political activist. You could consider yourself a good Christian or a good Jew or a good uh, Islamic, uh, you know, what would they call themselves an Islamicist, or Islamist, I don't know what the word would be, right? Even that what would seem to be a benign, favorable, good label is still terrible for your thinking process. So like I have a buddy, he is just maniacal in his adoration of Elon Musk. Right. Now, 
I think Elon is this fascinating guy. He's, he's truly a visionary genius. I mean, he has rallied an entire planet to colonize Mars. He's saving the environment with this Tesla car company, right? He's this brilliant guy. And, and then he bought Twitter and he bought Twitter. And can we just be real and say, it's been a total shit show for the first three or four weeks. And he fired half the people and, you know, with a terrible email, you right. know, in the middle of the night and no notice. And then he, they realized, wow, we fired people. We need to keep the site running. They had to beg people to come back. Some of them, they had to pay him a hundred thousand dollars more to get them to come back. Then he sends a email, you know, on the eve of Thanksgiving and fires 500 other people who had no notice, no idea it was coming. Um, and you could say, hey, Elon is a brilliant visionary genius and he has the empathy skills of an eggplant, right? Or same thing. <laughs> that was good. The empathy skills of an eggplant. I thought that was worth it. Keep going. <laughs> you know, he posted the Twitter files from the Talibi, the journalist. And uh, then he said, you see, this is, you know, threatening, you know, people's lost their First Amendment rights because the government forced Twitter to not publish the dick pics of uh, Hunter Biden. Well, no, that's not true. This had nothing to do with the Constitution. This had nothing to do with the First Amendment. New York Post wrote the story. They published it. Fox News talked about the story 24 hours a day. My friend who's the Elon fanboy talked about, he's a MAGA guy and he hates Biden. So he sent me 25 DMs a day about it. So I'm going to say nobody had their First Amendment rights. Now, by the way, just to right. be clear right. before anybody ats me and starts trolling me on Facebook or you know, on Twitter, um, the whole Hunter Biden thing was a disgrace. The way Twitter handled it was terrible, okay? They really, you know, but this is what happens in political campaigns. You look for dirt on your opponent and then you leak it to the media. And when your opponent gets dirt on you, on your guy, they leak it to the media and you try to suppress it. Now, in Twitter's case, 95% of the people who work there are were low, woke liberals. So they were happy to suppress the Hunter Biden story. But it had nothing to do with the First Amendment. It had nothing to do with the Constitution. But there's 50 million people in America right now who say, yes, the government, uh, you know, sabotaged the Constitution. Um, the, the Republicans were denied their First Amendment rights. Twitter censored the First Amendment. No, none of that's true. So we could say, hey, Elon Musk is a brilliant visionary genius and he doesn't understand how the First Amendment works. But you, if you identify as the fanboy of Elon so much, you know, no matter what he did, every stupid thing with my friend would be like, oh, it's so brilliant. You know, every entrepreneur in the world is going to be following his tactics and they realize they can lay off half their people and they can slash their overhead and they can be bold and daring. And, and I'm like, no, all he, these are in soccer, we call them own goals. Mm -hmm. When your player scores a goal for the other team. Right. Elon was doing own goals for all the people who say billionaires shouldn't exist. Now that you see Thanksgiving Eve, he fired 500 <laughs> people. You know? Right. Um, they had the two guys who trolled the media and they came out of the office building and said they were laid off Twitter workers and Elon retweeted that. And then, you know, some not very clever news outlets picked up the story and thought they were real. And then Elon was cackling about it on social media. And then he hired one of the guys last time I heard. And, you know, if he had someone around him who just could tell him the truth and not pump him up. That you know, critical thinking say, part. Yeah, Elon, you're the wealthiest man in the world. People aren't going to find it's funny that you're making fun of people who get fired, especially when you're the guy who fires them, you know? Right. Maybe just 
did this one out, Elon. You know, let's <laughs> yeah. let's go back to building rockets. Let's go back to Neuralink. Let's go back to all this other amazing work that you're doing to heal humanity, make the world a better place. Um, but you know, maybe that isn't the best thing. If you're a critical thinker, you can say. Bill Cosby was a brilliant, genius comedian. And I would never fucking let him in a room with my daughter. <laughs> okay. Right, right. You right. could say, you know, Elizabeth Warren is a really well meaning activist who wants to protect the most vulnerable people. And a lot of her political policies actually harm those people the most. She doesn't realize how evil socialism really is. That's what critical thinking is. You question the premise and you can accept that, oh, you know, I like uh, uh, Kanye had amazing, you know, created some of the most iconic music of his generation. And he's a seriously mental ill person who needs help. That's critical thinking, right? And same, every entrepreneur on this, when you're, you know, planning your new business, you're right. going to launch a new venture, you're going to create a new division, you want to develop a new product. You can't fall in love with the bad thought patterns. Like, like um, you know, when you invest, you say, hey, we've already invested $5 million in this we have to make it work. No, that's the sunk cost fallacy. Right. So that's you got to let it go. Model, right. It's just a bad mental model. Right. And sometimes the best decision is, hey, we need to write off that $5 million, close that shit down right now and go in a different direction. That's critical thinking. I know when we were, you and I did an event in Slovenia. Remember that one called the Eastern European Entrepreneur Intensive or whatever we did. We, we, so we flew, to, we flew to Slovenia, which was a formerly socialist country. And I, I, I spoke before you did, and then you spoke. So I spoke and I did something on business growth, you know, and entrepreneurship. And then you got up and you said, and you walked on stage, you sent it yourself and you said, socialism is just communism with lipstick. And, and I freaked out thinking that the, the, you know, the SWAT people were going to come through the windows and take our passports and we were going to get stuck. But what you went on to talk. Yeah. You remember that? It wasn't, it wasn't Slovenia. It was uh, Copenhagen, Cop Denmark. No, no. Very, we, I think it was Slovenia. It was, no, it was Copenhagen. Okay. Which is very, uh, Slovenia is really embraced free enterprise. But, but wherever it was, I remember you saying it. And I, I remember thinking to myself, that's ballsy to, to say it. But then you went on to talk about their programming, right? Because they had been programmed. And it's just like at the end of the, at the, end of the event, we looked at it and we thought, hey, um, you know, we didn't get a lot of interaction during the event. And what we, found, what we found is that they had been conditioned to go to conferences and not clap and not laugh and not... And then when the event was over, then all of a sudden everybody was clapping and everybody was asking questions. So it was just interesting to talk about the programming, which brings me to the next part. I did post a couple links to your website. It's on the screen here at randygage.com, the podcast and things. But talk about your daily routine and some of the things that you've done. You know, you've got your podcast, but what, how do you keep self-sabotage from returning? But what do you do in your daily routine to, to grow it and then keep it from returning? Um couple of things. And by the way, let me give, um, uh, here's another resource for people. Let me pull up my blog. Okay. Uh, go, uh, my, if you guys want some homework afterward, look for the section, the, the blog that says nine prosperity actions to take every day. And that's exactly along the sweet spot of the question you just asked. For me, um, I'm going to post that in the comments. I just, I just captured it, and I'm just going to go ahead and post it in the comments. So it's, it's already been posted right. everywhere. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so like for me, <laughs> some things I do, I shut down my devices at least an hour or two before I go to bed. I shut them down and I leave them to charge in a room I do not sleep in. My number one best thermonuclear prosperity tip I could ever give anyone is put your, shut your phone off and put it in a room where you're not sleeping. Don't make the last thing you see before you go to bed 
some shit post on Instagram. Don't make the first thing when you wake up the morning some breaking news alert from CNN, right? So I shut it down. Um, I wake up when I finish sleeping. I schedule my sleep so that I don't have to use an alarm clock, that I'll wake up naturally. Uh, and then I do, I do affirmations before I even get out of bed. I, I literally speak them out loud. And then I so what's an example? Of, can you share one example of one? So, so you get up in the morning, you're, you've, you've protected your time frame, you protected your mindset. And one of the things that I'm, I, I want to jump to, I'm taking a detour, a, a brain fart for a second. I remember you always said, I don't leave any in, emails in my inbox. Like you've done, you handle things once, you touch it once, where I end up fine. I mean, I've got 700 emails flagged because my processes aren't up to where they need to be. And you just handle it once. But so you get up in the morning, What's something that you say to yourself as an example of, a, of an affirmation that you use to build that mindset? Um, big ones I do all the time are, what a beautiful day today is. What a great day today is going to be. I am so blessed to live in this beautiful home. I look out, I have big floor to ceiling, you know, sliding doors in my bedroom. And I live on a, you know, I live in a penthouse on, in the middle of Biscayne Bay. So... I look out the window and I say, I'm so blessed to live in paradise. Money is attracted to me like a magnet. You can see I have a, a piece of artwork behind me from a Colombian artist. I have art everywhere in my house. So I have one, two, three, I have four pieces of art in my bedroom. And I say, I love to wake up surrounded by beauty. So those are like some of the affirmations I do uh, first thing in the morning. And, and then yes. I always do exercise every day right. and I always yeah. do self-development, personal growth. I love to read books. I love to listen to podcasts. What's a popular book? I mean, obviously you've, you've authored 14 books and you've got your prosperity series, which is a, you know, a bestseller along with the other ones you've done, which I, again, you guys can go to Amazon, search Randy Gage. You can see his, his resources. So tell me what's, what's another author or somebody that you have found that that's one of your best reads. I mean, back in the day when we were doing events, like on the entrepreneur event, I remember we were talking about think big and we've talked about a bunch of ones over the years, but as the years have developed, is there any go-to like the art of war or something that you turn back to every year that you want to reread? Um, not the art of war, but the war, war of art. art, the war of art. Sorry. Stephen, Stephen Pressfield. Pressfield. Stephen I read that yeah. every time I have an important creative project, I reread that because you can literally read the book in 20 to 30 minutes. Yeah. Um, I reread uh, Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand about every year or two, just to ground myself in the importance of living by a congruent uh, personal philosophy. Um, most influential books would be those um, uh, uh, James Allen, As a Man Thinketh, The Magic of Thinking Big, um, Prosperity by Charles Fillmore, The Science of Mind by Ernest Holmes, uh, and then contemporary stuff I like reading, like, you know, one, one of the, uh, some of the great books I read in 2022 uh, is a book called Build by Tony Fadal, who was the guy who led the team for the iPhone and the iPad and the, the Nest thermostat. He's the co-founder of that now. Uh, so he had a book called Build, which is really good. I love the books by Ben Horowitz, who's the <coughs> half of the Andreessen Horowitz uh, legendary venture capitalist firm. He has a couple of books. The, the big thing about big things, the bad thing about bad things. I don't know, but search Ben Horowitz. Uh, his books are mad genius. Uh, another one I read great this year for political junkies like me is Why We Did It by Tim uh, Miller, who is a, uh, he was a Republican operative who became a never Trumper and wrote a book about how did the Republican Party get sucked into following this crazy lunatic and never be able to pull themselves away. And um, it's, of course, it's a political book. So if you're a political junkie like me, but it's much more than a political book. 
I think everyone should read it because it's a case study of human behavior and herd thinking and how people, you know, fall for mind viruses and get manipulated. So it's very much in line with this uh, post that I have coming out Friday about these, you know, bad thought patterns or thinking patterns that you can fall prey to. Perfect. So as we, I'm just going to, I've got some comments that were coming in. So a lot of people are reacting to the show. So as we wrap this up, what are some hot tips that you can share with people? You know, they want to definitely, you know, stop volunteering for victimhood, which is what the whole show was about. What are the tips for living a prosperous life? You already talked about some of them, you know, obviously what you're reading, you have some of your rituals, but what are some things, some takeaways from a business standpoint that people in business need to do because they might be working on their culture and they have employees. Maybe their employees are disengaged or actively disengaged, or they have a workplace culture that isn't right. And, you know, the problem that I find as a, as a keynote speaker for organizations and you two, the groups you speak to is organizations don't know the difference the leadership that hires speakers don't know the difference between leadership, team building, management, communication, change, and culture. So that's like six different topics, right? But ultimately, right. it really comes down to how are they creating opportunities for growth in their culture? But so going back to the, the tips for living a prosperous life, tips for prosperous life and tips for a prosperous business. How can you make sure that your business is surrounded with employees that are actually actively engaged? Yeah, so for the personal life, that post that's coming out Friday, hang around for that, grab it, that's, that'll handle the personal end. Um, for the business thing, let's go back to Elon. Let's use him as a case study. Um, so, because he's really the perfect case study for entrepreneurs, right? Take the example of these layoffs and firings that he's done. My philosophy is this. And why I reacted so strongly was arguing with my MAGA friend, who's the Elon fanboy so much about it, was, I were, you know, I ran restaurants for a while. So restaurant industry, you have a 200% annual turnover. You're, you, you, you have to fire people all the time. And firing people is a horrific, horrific experience. If you have any kind of empathy, if you have any kind of soul, if you have any kind of heart, for most people, it's one of the worst 10 days of their entire life, the day they got fired. So you wanna do it with love, with care, with empathy. Um, but my philosophy on this is, if you're firing somebody and it's a surprise to them, then the problem is you, not them. Because your job as a leader is to let them know that their work was not acceptable. There, your job, there had to be warnings along the way. There had to be evaluations along the way, 360 analysis along the way, something where you let people know, hey, the kind of behavior you're doing isn't acceptable at this organization. And that's where I felt Elon really screwed up the Twitter thing because I think he has engineers at Tesla that would, and at um, SpaceX, that would crawl naked over broken glass to work for him. He said, man, you wanna take us to Mars? I want to work for you. And they idolize him. That's a different dynamic than when you buy an existing company like Twitter, which also has brilliant engineers who think they're contributing to the greater good. Right. And then this guy comes in from the outside and says, hey, you're all lazy, stupid people. There's 20,000 of you. I'm going to lay off 10,000 of you because the rest of you are useless. We're morons and you shouldn't be here anyway. And they didn't buy into that. A leader, he didn't understand the difference of, hey, I'm buying a place and taking over an existing culture. I don't, I didn't create the culture like I did when SpaceX was a startup, when the Boring Company was a startup, when Neuralink was a startup. And that's just, so that's a really right. valuable lesson if you're an entrepreneur. Like, okay, what is the culture I'm creating? What is, Everybody wants to be part of something bigger than themselves. 
That's why they join gangs. That's why they join religions. That's why they join cults. That's why they join political parties and other ideological movements. They want to be part of something bigger than themselves. Are you providing that in your business? And you say, I just, you know, I run a damn subway store. You know, I'm not saving the world. Okay, I get it. But you know what? You can create a culture where people feel, wow, I'm learning new skills. I'm building my work resume. I'm advancing my career. I'm taking care of my family. I'm providing for them. And I'm, you know, going to, I'm moving on <clears throat> to greater things. And, you know, I like to, when, when people work for me, and I try not to have anybody work for me anymore, I try to, you know, my, my Lornette is my personal assistant, been with me for like 30 years. She's retiring I know. end of the year. Crazy. Um, and um, I'm pretty much just working with like independent contractor stuff because I'm looking for a, a, a low maintenance lifestyle as I'm, you know, the horizon in front of me is closer than the horizon behind me. So I don't want to be in the employee business anymore. Um, but, you know, when you are, you, you know, you can, cre you know, when I, like when I did hire employees, I always like to just, hey, what are you here for? Why do you want this job? What is your goal here? And if they tell me, hey, my goal is just I need to make enough money to buy a new car. I'm looking for you know, a job I can work for two years and then I'm going to move to Europe and, you know, stay at hostels and backpack across the continent. Great. I will help support you in that goal. If you say, I want to work for you, learn from you and get promoted and work my way up. And my dream is one day I'm going to run your organization for you. Great. I'm going to support that. And if you tell me, I want to go to work for you. I want to learn everything you know, how you do it. And then I'm going to go set up my own shop and I want to compete with you. I, great. I support you for that. And I'm going to give you every, you know, I'm going right. to do everything I can to support your growth in that because that's a win-win for me. Right. That's going to make me a better entrepreneur. That's going to make my business stronger. And I'm approaching it from a prosperity consciousness, right? <clears throat> So whether you've got five toy stores or you run a Subway franchise or you've got a Midas muffler franchise or whatever, you know, are you giving people something bigger than themselves to be a part of? Are you respecting their dignity? Mm -hmm. Right. The biggest problem. Why is social media such a hot mess? Because it's the dehumanization of people. Right. You know, if you're a MAGA person, you just see Black Lives Matter people as insects. If you're a Black Lives Matter person, you just see Trump people as insects. You know, they're not even human to you, right? The That's what happens on social media. And unfortunately, that happens in workplace cultures too, where Oh, these employees, the inmates are trying to run the asylum. You know, all these people, if I'm not following, you know, looking at them 24 hours a day, they're stealing from me. They're calling in sick. They don't show up. They come in drunk. They're all lazy, stupid, ignorant people. Well, come on. What are you doing as an entrepreneur, as, a, as an, an employer, as a boss? You know, what are you doing to contribute to that? Because it's like, well, you know, all the people on social media, who are saying, oh, it's such a toxic dump of all, oh, you know, doom scrolling. Well, who are you found? If you got all these employees who are trying to steal from you, scam you, leave early, come in late, show up drunk, come in stoned, that doesn't happen by accident. Either you have dehumanized them or you have, you know, you're exploiting them or you're creating some kind of culture that isn't attracting the kind of people that you say you want. Yeah, I, I recently published a, a study and they can get it at Profit Rich Results. It's in the research tab. I'm, I, I'll maybe post a comment afterwards. I did a study last oh, year. Maybe you put it in their chat just like you do. Well, for I will. Stuff. I will. I have to Google it while I, well you, well, you have to say something brilliant so I can go get the link while we're talking. Uh, so just keep going with the brilliance. But I, I'll put the study in there. But we, we surveyed over a thousand people. It was a, a, a qualified study and we looked at what 
dry. Why do people stay? Why do they leave? We've done a couple other Fortify lives. You can go to YouTube and look at the playlist for Fortify and you can see some of the other topics that we've covered as it relates to this. So, you know, back to, back to prosperity mindset, give us, I'm going to let you look while I look for that post, but just name off some tips, like a list of things that you, you know, in summary that people can do to first identify if they have a prosperity mindset. So, so because a lot of people are delusional, right? And I think that, that, that happens where you talked about the identity and you talked about the conditioning, right? They get conditioned to believe a certain thing, but they don't even know why they think that way. And a lot of times I've challenged people's beliefs. They come in and they tell me, well, everybody says this. And I always go, well, who's everybody, you know? And they're like, well, a lot of people. And I'm like, well, who, who is a lot of people? And then it turns out, you know, their friend, it was one person. It's the same thing with sales calls. When I do sales training, they say, you know, the salespeople want to lower their price to get sales. And I always tell them, you know, if you're lowering your price to get a sale, then you're not adding value. You're not communicating the real thing, but they are not sold on the, what the product or service is. So it's like me as a keynote speaker, you know, my fees are 25 grand for a keynote when I go out and more if it's a, you know, a multiple event. And I've had booking agents that I hired before, and, you know, let's say I'm paying them 50,000 plus commission, you know, after 90 days, they're not really producing. And I, and I pulled this one lady in and her name is Brittany. And I said, well, what's going on? And she said, well, I just don't understand how you can go out and speak t for two hours and make the same amount of money that I, that I make. And I'm like, it's interesting that you're comparing yourself. A lot of people compare themselves, like, just like me. I mean, you know, I've got friends of mine, Steve Sims from Wichita Fix It. He is, uh, he's a handyman that goes out and he's probably watching this live. He, he participates in a lot of the live events and he goes out and does, uh, he has his YouTube channel and it's got, you know, um, 10, 10 or 20 million views on YouTube and 10,000 subscribers because he just uses his cell phone and does it. But I think people compare themselves to everybody else when really they need to clean up their own backyard before they worry about the neighborhood. So as you think about the things I've mentioned to identify, you know, how do you know that you're really self-sabotaging? You have a, you've had the experience of dream boards and the prosperity map that you had before. What are some things that they need to take away as, a, as an action list? All right, so go, let's go back to this thought of question the premise. I love, I, I retweeted Gary B today because he, his post was about how when he started out and he decided to become like a coach to entrepreneurs and everybody told him, don't do that. You're the wine guy. Don't try to be something you're not. You're the wine guy. And he saw himself as something bigger than the wine guy. And look at the incredible... Uh, practice that he's manifested for himself. And every one of you watching this, listening right now, you have people around you who are saying that. Well, come on, let's be reasonable. You know, is it really, you know, girls don't really become doctors. Have you thought about being a nurse, right? <laughs> There's still that kind of like hundred year old belief structures in place in so many businesses. Um, and ask yourself, you know, who Jim Rohn famously said your income will be the five, the income, the average income of the five people you spend the most time with. Uh, I would say that goes all in all areas of your prosperity. Your marriage is going to be at the average satisfaction level of the five couples that you guys socialize with the most. Your health is going to be the average healthiness level of wellness as the five people, you know, you associate with the most. Your relationships, your mental harmony, all of those things. So uh, when you're an entrepreneur, um, I don't remember, I think it was Elon who said, you know, being an entrepreneur is like gazing into the void, chewing on glass. Um, it's a lonely, lonely business, man. You know it. I know it. Everybody listening know it. When you are the gal or the guy who's got to make the payroll on Friday, that is the loneliest spot on earth. And, um, it, and it's also one of the greatest gifts to be an entrepreneur, right? Mm -hmm. So, you, you've got to, I think entrepreneurs have to work much more on their self-esteem and their self-awareness and their prosperity consciousness than employees do, than everyone else in the world does. The other artists, politicians, there's nothing. If you're an entrepreneur, 
you need prosperity consciousness more than anyone else because you're the one who creates the culture in your team, which creates the culture in your organization. Okay, you can't just say, all right, we have a new policy. We want to surprise and delight all our customers. If you're treating all your employees like shit, and right. then you come down from the mountain with your tablet that says we're going to, you know, delight and surprise all of our, you know, customers, that dog don't hunt. Right. What's the culture you created? The core culture in that business. Are you are you treating your employees the way you want them to treat the customers? Things like that. That that's the kind of tangible stuff I think that applies to entrepreneurs. Yeah, I, I really agree. And I, I post the link in the comments, but it's on the screen too. So it's at profitresults.com forward slash employment hyphen strategies hyphen report. And that's for your podcast listeners. So profitrichresults.com forward slash employment hyphen strategies hyphen report. You can go get that and report. All right. So closing thoughts. First of all, thank you for spending the time with me an hour. Um, I'll be making sure you get the replay so you can post it to your fans. I know you've got private groups that you work on. Uh, but uh, before you do that, I, I do want to talk about a couple of the other events that you're doing, right? You've got, you've got, you, you've decided to be really strategic. You have your tribal community and your tribal event every year, and they, they can get that at tribalevent.com, right? It's Randy Gage tribal event. Yeah. And that's for those critical thinkers that want to go to really elevate their thinking. And that's, I've been going for years. It's a, it's one of the best events on helping you develop that mindset because, you know, it's, I think it was Jim Rohn who also said, you know, training isn't something you did. It's something you do, right? It's not like you go to an event and you're, you're fixed. It's, or Sig Ziglar, I think it was, who's, who's talking about training that continues. Um, that it's not, a, it's not a one and done thing. You don't just read the book and you're done. You have to work on your prosperity consciousness and make it part of your daily routine, which is really what this whole episode's been about, right? If you want to get out of victimhood, you first have to identify and say, I'm, I'm sitting in a pile of crap. I need, to, I need to get out of this. And then what is the roadmap? And I think for me, what the biggest thing was taking 100% responsibility for my actions and inactions. And that's really important, my actions and inactions. So wherever I am right now with my wealth, uh, you know, as an example of my inner peace or, or my, my the work is that I'm responsible. So ultimately, when you start with taking responsibility for where you are in your own success, that really drives growth. So what are some, some closing thoughts as we wrap up the show today? Well, I love what you're doing with this. I love the way you're going. Um, I would amplify what you said about taking responsibility for your actions. Uh, I, it always goes back to that question that I asked myself, you know, who was the one person who was <laughs> always at the scene of the Yeah, you used, you used that with me way too many times. I remember I had some turnover. And I remember calling you on a, on a Wednesday, on a Friday. I'm just going to jump in here. We're going to keep going the show, keep going with the show. And I called you because I had my, my sporting goods business and I needed, I needed to make payroll on a Monday. And it was Friday at like 3.30. And you and I had money in a different account. And I called you and I said, Randy, Randy, can I just move $40,000 from our account and I'll give it back to you in two weeks? And you said to me in your calm, quiet voice, you said, Ford, there's no free cheese in the mousetrap. Okay. You said, there's no free cheese. Go sell something. And I'm like, no, Randy, but, but I got to do this. And he, and you, you said, you know, stop arguing for your limitations and go sell something. And I'm like, but Randy, I, and you, you said, I'm done. Talk to me next week. So I got off the phone with you and I was like, holy crap, what am I going to do? And I went and put a sales letter together about joining my 10K program, which was a, a marketing thing that you had in one of your things. So I kind of modeled it. It's not stealing, I modeled it. And so I sent out an email to 4,000 people with a, a list that said, you know, join Ford's 10K program. I'll work with you as your private marketing mentor for six months. I'm going to give you my success library. I'm going to be available for calls. Back then it was go to meeting, not Zoom. And so I put this whole thing together and I sent the email about 6.30 on a Friday night thinking if I can just get four people to buy the 10K, I can make a profit. And I came in on Monday and I didn't check the shopping cart. I didn't check my email because I was too fear-based to look at it because all the whole weekend I was just like, it's going to work, it's going to work. And on Monday I came in and nine people had signed up for my $10,000 six-month thing. Now, I, of course, I was all alighted, uh, delighted until I had to do the work for the next six months. And I became, you know, it, it was not profitable by the time I got done because everybody 
you know, I was their personal marketing department for the next six months, but I learned a valuable lesson. And, and then, so that was the first lesson from that. And the second lesson on that same thing was when I was getting ready to relaunch it, I had my Word document up where I was writing the copy and you and I, you know, we've done copywriting boot camps together. So I'm going through the headline, the subhead and the benefits and the features and the social proof and the credibility. And I'm going through the copy and I'm thinking, okay, what am I going to charge for this? And so I thought, well, I know what I'm going to do. It was too long. I'm going to go for 90 days. And um, do I double the price or do I do it five grand for 90 days since it was 10 grand for six months? I went to lunch, came back and, you know, in my classic Ford, not reading everything I do, which you've given me crap about for years, I just sent the email and I changed it to, to 90 days for 10 grand and I got 20 people signed up. And what I found was that people would rather pay more for a shorter period of time because it's about the perception. They still got the value, everybody. So everybody listening, and I've got people that are probably part of this, my community in there that have, have participated in that. But it was just interesting about the mindset. So, you know, you always said there's no such thing as a money problem. It's an idea problem. Go, if you want to make more money, go create, you know, go get better ideas. And my, my take on that has always been, if you want to make more money, add more value. You know, so if you're a business owner and you want to grow sales, how are you communicating your value? If you're in a relationship and you want a better relationship, how do you add more value? So one of my primary questions that I've used over the years from your prosperity training was one, have a prosperity map, which is another thing for a dream board. And two, start with those affirmations on the way to work and the way home. I have YouTube channels and YouTube videos that I've, because I pay the 19 bucks a month for YouTube so I can download the YouTube to my phone. And it also takes all the ads out so I don't have to listen to the ads. Um, but I can listen to them on airplanes. So I've, I've used a lot of the strategies. So I just hope that the listeners today realize that. So going back to you for your closing thoughts, if it wasn't for that, you gave me the vision of, you know, you, you gave me the tough love, which we've, we've had some pretty good come to Jesus meetings over the years, including this one, everybody last week, Randy's like, where's the link to promote the live event? I'm like, Randy, I I'm dead stream yard. This is like my fifth episode. He goes, but you're not promoting it. And I'm like, I'll figure it out. So then Alex and I, who's, who's sitting just off camera here, I'm going to see if I can open up the camera. Um, you can, you can wave Alex. So there's Alex. He's in making sure that the show, the show notes and everything are, are going the way they're supposed to. But Alex was like, I don't know. So this morning we figured out in StreamYard, we have to mark all the different things. Then it creates all the events, but it's those critical thinking, tough love, taking responsibility. That's where it started for me. And then it's what, what the routine is. Closing thoughts for you, Mr. Gage. So thanks for joining us for the show today. <laughs> yeah, I believe that prosperity is created two of three ways. Number one, you just mentioned you solve problems and number two, you add value or number three, you envision superior possibilities. If you can solve problems, you will never worry about making a payroll. You just won't. If you're really solving problems, when you say, I want to open a pizzeria like I did and say, okay, I'm opening this Friday night and I'm sure we're going to sell 25 pizzas because you know, people will be walking by and driving by and whatever. Well, I opened the pizzeria and we sold one pizza, which was a call that came in because we kept the phone number of the last pizzeria that went bankrupt. And uh, they thought they were calling the old guy. They got us. I had a driver. You know, I, he, he made $1 delivery charge. They worked just for delivery charge and tips. So he made a dollar delivery charge. He tipped him two bucks. I gave him like 25 bucks so that he would show back the next day, which he didn't. I never saw him again. Right. Um, but I wasn't solving any problems. I wasn't adding any value, right? I mean, I could solve the problem of, hey, there's people who are hungry for pizza at 7.30 on Friday night and they're watching a good movie and they don't wanna leave the house. But if I haven't let them know that I can solve that problem, they have no way to contact me. If you add value, right? If, if you, if you go to, if you can help any organization do something faster, cheaper, better, they will gladly pay you money. Um, and when you envision a superior possibility, that's what Steve Jobs did with the, the iPad. Nobody was saying, well, I need a phone that's 10 times bigger, or I need a computer without a keyboard that I can carry around, you know, nobody was thinking right. like that. 
But he envisioned the iPad, and as soon as people saw it, they were like, oh, I gotta have one of those, right? He envisioned a superior possibility. And a lot of times you can do all three of those things. So the, the here's the final thing that I would say to all the entrepreneurs. Go back to this you know, thing I retweeted from Gary today where he uh, said, everybody told him, you know, you're the wine guy, just you know, stay in your lane, be the wine guy. You know, they tell LeBron James, you know, just shut up and dribble. Um, there is, it is not a coincidence that Uber was formed by people who were not in the taxi business. It's not a coincidence that Amazon was founded by people who were not in the retail business. It's not a coincidence that Airbnb was created by people who were not in the hotel business. They didn't have the preconceived conventional beliefs, and that's why they were able to disrupt their market, the markets that they chose to enter. And every entrepreneur listening in the sound of my voice right now, every franchisee in the sound of my voice right now, ask yourself, how would I disrupt my own business? How would I come in here and find a way to solve problems better, add more value, or envision superior possibilities. And that's always gonna make you successful. And then just do the homework on right. your core foundational beliefs and make sure that when your success shows up for you, you're willing to accept it. Well, fantastic. Uh, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and find my applause button. Here we go. So. We're going to put the applause on I, I, Randy, thank you so much for being here. Everybody, the links are to the show notes, and we'll also post uh, the replays for everybody. And uh, real quick, just for let everybody know that we go live Wednesdays at 11 o'clock Central on LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook, and then we promote it out on Twitter and everything else. So, uh, Randy, thank you so much for being here today. It's It's been a blessing, and I know we went long, but this is a, it was, I just said we go as long as we want to do to make this work. So... Anyway, that's it for Fortify Live. I'll see everybody Wednesdays, 11 o'clock Central, and you can watch the replay. Thanks again, Randy.